recently came, a, uh, came across a story about a pastor who just died. And during his wake, people were asked uh, to come forward and say a few words uh, about this pastor. One person came and said, when I was sick and I was at the hospital, this pastor prayed for me regularly and visited me once a week. I praise God for this pastor. Another person said, when our house burned down, he find ways to shelter us, bring us food, and prayed for us regularly. I praise God for this pastor. Another person came and said, when I lost my job, this pastor came forward and found ways to give me food to eat, visited me once a week, I praise God for this pastor. And many, many still came forward to say many good words about this pastor. The last person, a young man who came, whose face was a bit perplexed, spoke and said, now I know where my dad was when I needed him the most. My heart cries out for this young man because I believe that the ministry starts at home. It's not that we are bad people. It's just that oftentimes we want to serve so much that we forget our role in the family. And I entitled uh, the message this morning, Shaping Your Arrow. If you try to uh, Google parenting, um, you will come across dozens and dozens of principles and advice about how a person can parent. This morning is not about those type of principles. Psalm 127 verses 3 to 5 again reads, Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. I've entitled it Shaping Your Arrow because I, I feel it's not my role to craft or create um, my children. My children are for God, uh, of God. They are from God. And I have only been given the responsibility to shape as they grew and mature. And that's what we hope to be able to discuss this morning. Why don't we all go to God in prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you would allow us to just experience you this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to each one of us. As we look at each faces, the heart of each one, the condition of each one is different. But we know that whatever our heart's condition is, you can minister to us in a very specific way. So we pray, Father, that you would just bless us with your spirit. Allow us to benefit from your word and come away from this place with treasures that come from you. We pray, Father, that you would be the one to speak this morning, that you will override whatever preparation has been made, and that you will speak only the ones that you wish to be heard. We want to lift all praise and glory to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I would feel I'm the least qualified, and I will never say I'm an expert on parenting. In fact, I would be very, very far off from the term perfect. <clears throat> Again, this message is not, not about a series of clear steps or standards of absolute guide to parenting. There is no cookie cutter for parenting. Um, again, if we Google these items on the internet, clearly many others will be more qualified to speak on this particular topic. But instead, I will be sharing three basic principles which is also just a reminder and also specifically a reminder for me 
And what I will be sharing is based on my recent experience and encounters. In summary, when I talk about me shaping my arrow, I would speak of three things. The first one is to remind me that I do not own my children. The second one is that I need to love, but not only love, but also accept. And the third one, uh, to seek to understand, then to be understood. This psalm is uh, entitled A Song of Ascent, uh, A Song of Solomon. Most believe Solomon to be the author, yet it is possible that the psalm was composed by David for Solomon. And the psalm opens with, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Solomon understood that the work of man had its place, but it meant nothing apart from God. Without the work and the blessing of God, whatever we do is nothing. Without God's work, without God's blessing, we labor in vain. It is important to note that it is possible in this particular passage that the word house could refer to as family. It may also mean raising a family. In the Old Testament, it is usual to speak of a family as a house, as in referring to a house, referring to a family in terms of one's dynasty. I don't often advertise, in fact, I don't really advertise that I counsel or coach uh, teenagers or our young ones, but for some reason, I get connected uh, to some parents who would request me to spend time with their children. So uh, I have taken it as part of a ministry, a personal ministry, and spend time with these children, or not children, young ones, teenagers. And with all the, the, the topics that we are able to discuss, some of the common things that I have been requested to do is, can you look into my son's case? He's lost interest in finishing school. He can't finish his thesis. He does not know what to do with his or her life. Lost the will to pursue anything significant. <clears throat> For some reason, they would end up being in a conversation with me. And part of the things that I have discovered will be part of what I will be sharing with you, drawn from these experiences. But it also helped me look into my own life as a parent on how I view my children and how I see myself as a dad, as a parent. If I were to summarize this, these are the ones I found to be in common. I mentioned them earlier. The first one is we do not own our children. In verse 3, it reads, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Oftentimes, we are tempted to exercise excessive power and unwarranted authority. Unknowingly, when this happens, and, and we do this because we believe this is for the best interest of our children, but unknowingly, this is expressed in some form of frustration, disgust, disapproval. And sometimes it is reflected in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. As if the Lord spoke to me once and asked me or told me, if I were to face God in heaven and talk to me about my parenting, it made me wonder, is God going to ask me, did your son graduate on time? Was your son ever famous in school? Did he pass with flying colors? 
Or maybe God would simply ask me, were you a good and faithful father? What would be God's standard? Of course, all these are good to consider, but the most important question is, were we faithful in parenting our children? Oftentimes when we pray, and I would hear this a lot, we would want to experience the presence of God. And we would pray, Father, may you allow us to experience your presence. Father, we invite your presence. But over the years, I have learned that not only are we to invite the Lord's presence in the midst of our family, but we are also to invite his lordship with his presence. And that spells a difference because God's presence would often mean sometimes that he's just there as an expectator, but he's not a spectator, he is the Lord. So when we invite God's presence, we should also invite his lordship in the midst of our family. I need to be reminded that my children are not my own. How is God speaking to us this morning about the ownership of our children? That's the first one. We don't own our children. The second one is love and accept. Love can be expressed in many ways, but I would like to zero in on two possible things. Two things. Number one, love spelled as time, and the other one spelled as communication. Um, many of you are um, not really distant. I mean, uh, how am I supposed to say this? Many of you know us as a family. We've been in journey together for about um, 10 years now, I think. Uh, Jubilee has been in support of our family uh, almost the time when we joined our ministry. And you were with us when my late wife passed away. Um, and we continue to remember uh, the goodness of God through Jubilee. There was a time when my late wife, when, when she passed, uh, we had to transfer uh, a different location. We had to transfer to a small condominium in uh, because of our situation, um, we didn't have much space. So my daughter, Keisha, she was um, not too big, maybe 13, 14 years old at that time. And we would sleep together in one bed. Um, that was our situation. And at one point, we started talking about me being a father to my children and I felt bad. I said, I cannot even provide you your own room. I can't imagine my daughter sleeping on the same bed with her dad. And then she went on to say, Papa, you don't realize that those moments were precious moments when we were able to talk deep and considered matters that are truly important. Well, I was taking a negative. My daughter, Keisha, was taking it a positive because it was a wonderful way for us to be able to experience deep communication. Love spelled as communication. I often brought them to the office, Ken and Keisha. Ken is taller than me now. Um, <clears throat> but when they were little, I would bring them to the office, uh, the Frontier's office, and the people at the office will ask them, do you like to be just like your dad? when you grow up. Um, and they will say, no, we don't want to be like our dad. And they will say, why? Because when we come to the office with Papa, Papa is always like this. And then when he comes home, he's always like this. Papa is always busy. We don't want to be like Papa. <clears throat> I've learned so much from that particular incident that I changed my mindset. I communicated to my children that they cannot come to me whenever I'm busy. 
I realized that I was trying to communicate something inappropriately or incorrectly. So I changed my attitude. I gave instruction to the office that whatever I'm doing, even if I'm in a meeting, and whoever I am meeting with, if my children will call, I will always take their phone call. I want my kids to remember that when they come to me, I will always be available for them. I changed my perception, and I would tell my children, Papa is occupied, but Papa is never busy. So when we say we're busy, we're too focused and cannot be bothered. I, I want my children to understand that I may be doing something and I'm always occupied, but when they come to me, I can redirect focus to spend attention with them. <clears throat> I have been privileged to coach a lot of executives, uh, managers. Oftentimes when we would catch up and I would ask, how are you doing? Maybe 80%, 90% of the time, oh, buddy, I'm so busy. So much to do this week. I'm so busy. 80%, 90% of the time, that word will always come out. Um, it makes you wonder why we are drawn to do that. Because oftentimes we associate busyness with our significance. We find significance depending on how much we do and how much people need us. People always associate this busyness on how important we may think we are. The more busy you are, the more important you are. That is why I encourage my kids to keep understanding that Papa is always occupied but never busy. It has been that way for about 15, 16 years now. <clears throat> Another word, love spelled us acceptance. The New Testament word that was used for acceptance, paradecomai, means to receive or not to reject, to acknowledge one's own. It would also be good to say to endure without protest or reaction, to make a favorable response. I read uh, about a lady who writes children's books, Tahere Maf. She said, my parents loved us, but I wasn't always sure they liked us. That is the reason why I, I group the two together, love, in acceptance. Why? Because we know there's so many ways to love our children, but oftentimes we are not able to communicate that we accept them. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine was helping his son, and he even, even started, uh, helped his son start a, a business, an automotive repair shop business. And for some reason, they always quarrel. And my friend said, he was telling me this story, and he said, Alam mo naman, anak, mahal na mahal kita. You know, son, that I really love you very much. And the son said, Alam ko naman yun, daddy. Mahal mo ako, pero never once did you really accept me. It is very easy for us to communicate that we love our kids, but how often do we communicate that we accept where they are. Acknowledge as one's own to endure without protest or reaction. A lot of times our kids are in situations that we are not agreeable with, which reminds me that when we disciplined our kids starting from when they were young, we only disciplined or spanked for two reasons. And of course, these two reasons would involve sin. One is when they disobey, and the other one is if they disrespect or dishonor. Any other thing that they do, like break a glass or uh, be caught in traffic and come home late, we don't discipline them for those. We only discipline them for disobedience 
and disrespect. For that, they know that we will accept them for who they are. My son Ken had a struggle because of the pandemic of finishing his thesis, and he was so pressured that uh, he went into some form of crisis of being on a deadlock, not being able to finish his thesis. And when we sat down and asked him why, he said, I cannot be like you, Papa. Uh, your standards are too high. I said, really? I don't even have a standard. I didn't realize that I was communicating to my son that I expected him to finish, finish well and finish on time. Of course, I wanted him to finish on time. I wanted him to finish well because his, uh, I think, tenure was running out. Uh, I think in UP, there, you only have seven, seven years. After that, you'll, you're going to have to leave. But I had to sit down with him, pray with him, and eventually told my son, Ken, life is not an education race. Life has even deeper meanings than just finishing university. It is important, of course, it is every parent's dream, but for them to feel pressure because of our excessive, unwarranted authority, we might be communicating frustration, therefore them feeling not accepted. Life is not an education race. How is God speaking to us about loving and accepting our children? Number one, we don't own our children. Number two, love and accept. <clears throat> and the third one, I actually borrowed from Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. It's seek to understand, then be understood. <clears throat> I once told my daughter when she was of age, because I like to cook and my eldest Ken, he also likes to cook. And we have to force Keisha to cook. So when we were just candidly conver con conversing, I said, Anak, ikaw ang babae, dapat ikaw nagluluto. It was some sort of a joke, but maybe sounded like a chauvinist uh, comment. But just to encourage my daughter, she stepped out of the kitchen, went to her room, and she started crying. I said, Ang babaw naman nun. Yun lang sinabi ko, iyak na agad. So I sat down with my daughter and I said, Honey, what's wrong? I'm sorry, Papa offended you. Would you like to talk? And then she said, I have always imagined that when I start to learn cooking, it will be Mama who will be teaching me. To cook. So the issue was not just about her cooking, but she was in trauma and missing her mom, but I never understood that. I never saw that picture. That's why we need to seek to understand and then be understood. Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And because I'm a coach, I would often engage my kids in conversation. It has become a natural thing. <clears throat> and sometimes my kids will, will reply, <clears throat> Papa, can you not be my coach this time? I just need a dad. I just need a father who will listen. Because of my interest to help, I forget that in the best interest of my children, I simply have to sit down and let them know I am there and listen. My sense of duty to equip my children to prepare for the future is totally understandable, but it is not dependent ultimately on me, really. It depends on God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, he talks about he who is faithful, he will fulfill it and will bring it to pass. The success is not mine, 
but the Lord. Paul trusted God to what he couldn't do, prepare people, prepare his disciples, prepare the church for the eventual return of Jesus Christ. We need to trust God for the well-being and the preparedness of our children. Paul teaches us that growth in the lives of those we care for is ultimately in the hands of God. How is God speaking to you about listening so that we can understand? We have been given a huge task, a big responsibility to care for families, and I feel we are privileged. Everyone here, as I look around, we are so privileged. Our ministry <clears throat> of countering human trafficking is a different story. <clears throat> We've encountered so many families who are struggling. And here, here are just some statistics on children being exploited. Because 24 million Filipinos live below poverty line, 60% of violence in childhood does not happen in school. 60% of violence in childhood does not happen in communities, but 60% of childhood happens in the home. 42% of clients served by DSWD in 2020 are women and children who were trafficked and prostituted. We now rank number one in the world in online child sexual exploitation. These are sobering statistics. And one of the more painful thing, 41% of perpetrators are parents. A few weeks ago, we were privileged to have been able to join an operation. One was on May 22. They were just two days apart. We were able to rescue five minors. <coughs> 17-year-old female, 10-year-old male, 9-year-old female, 3-year-old male, 2-year-old male, all in the same family. Two days later, we got into an operation that permitted us to rescue four children, one 14-year-old male, one 13-year-old female, one three-year-old male, and one five-month-old male. This is such a sobering, sobering experience. The only comfort I have is from John 16, 33. The Lord himself said, in this world you will have troubles, but he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And the Apostle John writes, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. When we try to go around and, and uh, do this operation, we're often asked, buddy, what is freedom to you? We would define freedom as a complete circle. It's not just being able to take them out of their condition. It is to be able to reintegrate back to society, being able to restore their dignity and through that, it is our hope and prayer that they will find Jesus. One key element that allows a survivor to thrive is when they experience a sense of belongingness, being part of a family. The closest experience they can have is being cared for in a home, like a foster home, or at least being invited to dine in one's home and experience how it is to be loved and accepted, be listened to, realize that they belong to God. I often ask myself, Lord, how can the church be involved? Can we serve in this way and be hands and feet that they may come to know you? So we need to be constantly reminded the privilege that we have as parents, that we need to be faithful to the call of being parents to our children. I close with the same verse I open. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. 
Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father, we submit ourselves to you and confess that we are nothing without you. Like Paul said, apart from you, we can do nothing. And even the caring for our children and responsibility bestowed upon parents, but can only be successful through the power of your Holy Spirit. So I pray, Father, you would allow us to learn from your word to value these young ones, the children that you have entrusted to us, that you would allow us, Lord, to continuously recognize that we do not own our children and that our children belongs to you, and that we need to love and accept them, and that we need to seek to understand first then to be understood. We submit ourselves to you in humility and trust that you will enable us, Father. We commit to you ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.